just a half more minute and we'll get started. We're recording. Great. Okay, I'm going to get started. People are trickling in. Welcome everyone to the Matrix Conversations and Transformations, a seminar series from the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice. I'm Mary Christianakis. I'm the uh, chair of the department. I'm joined by my co-organizers of the series, Professor Heldman. And she's the incoming chair of Critical Theory and Social Justice and Professor Malik Moazam Dulat. A bit about the series. The series focuses on pressing current events and seeks to connect our community with experts, scholars, artists, and the most effective activists with the aim of bringing you conversations that help us all better understand the problems we face, helping us identify the concrete and specific actions we could take to make a meaningful and real uh, change to ourselves and to our social conditions. This summer, our series will address several crises, the complex and far-reaching effects of COVID-19, the pandemic that has um, affected all of us. And in this case today, we're gonna um, look at um, the impact on immigrant communities, as well as other, other legislation that's going to, that has impacted immigrant communities. We also look at in this series, uh, political violence, in particular, the violence of the US police forces against black people and its deep uh, roots and broad effects on our society. Um, just a look ahead. We have two events coming up on Wednesday, June 24th, Anastasio Sangelopoulos will talk about the difficulties and traps of COVID-19 data and modeling. His talk is titled Dark Data and COVID-19. Um, and then next Wednesday, we will host Josh Marshall, the Brown History PhD, Polk Award winning journalist and founder of the influential political news and investigative journalism website, Talking Points Memo. He'll discuss the 2020 election in light of the political corruption, his specialty and um, his view from the um, New York City uh, police violence and pandemic. These colloquial will continue throughout the summer and into the fall. Registration for all the links are available at oxy.edu slash matrix. We will also record these events, so this is currently being recorded, and make them available in the future via the same website. We're on Instagram at ctsjoxy if you want to keep up with the series and with the department's work. Please note that we are using webinar format today, and that means you can submit your questions at any time via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll address your questions throughout the seminar. Today, it is our honor to bring you Maritza Aglundes, a managing attorney and student legal services director at CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrants' Rights. Maritza graduated from Occidental College with a double major in politics and urban and environmental policy. Maritza began her career at CHIRLA as an intern for the Community Organizing Department. She received her law degree from Southwestern Law School, where she was part of the Latino Law Student Association Board, a teacher assistant for the legal writing course and the property course. Maritza also received two Cali Awards in property and legal professions, externed at Community Legal Services in Compton and was a federal judicial extern to the Honorable James Otero. She was also part of the Youth Parole Clinic where she represented offenders. Her honors include MABF Scholarship, the MALDEF Scholarship, and the Southwestern Public Intern Law Service Award. She has dedicated her entire career to public service. She's an active member of the State Bar of California, the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California, and a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Please welcome her. Hello. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm going to go right into my presentation. Um, I just want to let everyone know my voice is a little uh, sore. I've been doing a lot of presentations since the DACA ruling came out. So please um, excuse me if I take a sip of water while I'm going through this. And then I'm also wearing my Home is Here shirt, which is why you don't see me in my usual suit. But I'm really excited about the DACA decision. I'm going to take the celebration on. So. Uh, just those two things. 
And so I'm going to jump right into it um, so we can explain what the DACA decision means. So sorry about that. Give me one second. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can all see the presentation and we can get started. Okay, great. So So again, as mentioned, I, uh, I work for CHIRLA, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights, and uh, we are presenting on the DACA decision that came down this Thursday from the Supreme Court. So I want to give a little background on what DACA is and how did we get to the point where we are now. So on June 15th in 2012, um, our President Obama ordered an executive order for deferred action. Deferred action allows for individuals to, do, um, to be protected against deportation. So from that executive order, uh, there was a lot of uh, requirements that needed to be met in order for undocumented youth to receive deferred action protection. And then that also allowed for them to receive benefits, including a work permit, a social security card, and eligibility for certain programs like Medicaid. So this was done through an executive order by President Obama. And then what is the, what does the Supreme Court decision actually mean? So if you wanted to look up the decision yourself and read the opinion, you can find it at the following, um, <clears throat> at the following docket. Uh, an actual docket number hasn't been assigned, but if you Google that, that'll, that'll allow you to see the entire opinion. So on uh, Thursday at seven in the morning, we all got the decision that we were waiting for. If you were part of the immigration movement, you were always hoping for this news. We were all shocked. Um, I was very happy to be wrong about something for the first time. Um, we were expecting for the court to terminate the program. All immigration attorneys and legal services providers, I believe, were expecting the same outcome. And we were all very much surprised with what the, what the court ruled. So the court held a 5-4 majority, and it, it basically stated that DHS had unlawfully rescinded DACA. Um, it was a procedural opinion, so I'll go into what this means legally in a second. But what really stood out to us in the legal community that do, that do immigration is the, the wording and, and what the court actually said, which was that it was arbitrary and capricious for DHS to end deportation protection components despite only um, finding that the benefits were illegal. So. We want to make sure that we focus on, on the wording that was used by the Supreme Court um, because this is actually a monumental decision coming out of the Supreme Court using this type of wording to discuss a decision. So arbitrary and capricious to end DACA without considering the impact of DACA on individuals and the larger economy means that the court um, needed, I'm sorry, the Trump's administration administration needed to actually address why and how and when these impacts would have on individuals, our economy, our community. And they did not. They did not do that. And that was one of the reasons why the court decided not to um, uphold the unlawful rescind rescinding of DACA. So I'm going to go into what that means for, for the community, what that means for DACA recipients. And so, so what did the court actually decide? So the court ruled in favor of the DACA program, which means that it rejected the uh, Trump's administration's attempt to end the program. So Trump in 2017, after DAPA, which um, was the deferred action for the parents, was was terminated they used that same reasoning to try and terminate daca uh there was a ruling that actually stated that dapa was unlawful because parents um, should not be receiving benefits through the federal government if they were undocumented 
And that same reasoning is the reasoning that they tried to use to end DACA. So the court made it clear that the executive branch of the government must be held accountable for the decisions that would end lives with the stroke of a pen. So the Supreme Court has ruled that because the Trump's administration attempt to end DACA did not include the impact that it would have on our community and our, on an, our economy, then there was no valid argument or no valid reason as to why DACA should be uh, terminated. And because there isn't any valid reason or there isn't any valid argument or any valid research to uphold the termination of the program, this is why the Supreme Court has decided to not terminate the program. So even though they did not answer the legal question as to whether DACA is, is, is legally uh, valid, they did answer the procedural question, which was that Trump's administration attempt to terminate the program in the way that they took these steps was not uh, a legal a way to terminate the program. So because the, the court has ruled that the attempt to terminate the program by Trump's administration in 2017 is vacated, that means that the program is completely restored back to the initial um, program that uh, President Obama had put in place back in 2012 because they completely vacated the previous decision. <clears throat> so what does this mean for DACA recipients? So if you currently hold DACA at this very moment, you, can, you, are con you still continue to be protected from deportation and you're still eligible for the benefits that you had under the DACA program, like a work authorization and your social security number. And you also will continue to reapply and renew your DACA every two years at this very moment. So that's what that means for DACA recipients. What does this mean for the community? So now we are talking about what effect it has on people that do not have DACA. So because the previous decision was vacated and the program is restored back to its initial uh, conception that happened in 2012, then eligible individuals who never had DACA should be able to apply at this time if they meet the requirements that um, were set forth for the program when it started. And that means that all uh, eligible individuals um, should consult with the legal services provider for more information about how to apply for DACA for the first time. And if you're renewing and you have it, then you also should uh, apply for renewal immediately and you should get screened for other immigration relief as, as uh, you're seeing um, legal service providers, because it's possible that you might have a more permanent um, immigration relief available to you, but you just never been screened for it. And um, there's many times when I do these screenings uh, as an immigration attorney, and it turns out that a lot of these recipients, or not a lot, but a handful of these recipients might be U.S. citizens that they're derived from parents or grandparents. So it is actually really important that we go out and we consult with the legal services provider. It can be someone like Trilla. We provide our services uh, for free at the moment. So, uh, so you can get screened and see if you're eligible for other relief. So that's what that means for the community. And now, what are the requirements for initial and first DACAs? And this is when we're going to get a little bit into the weeds on how COVID is actually affecting um, DACA as, as we speak after this decision has been ruled out. So the requirements for an initial or a first time person trying to apply for DACA is that you were under the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012. And you are over uh, 15 at the time you request unless you are in removal proceedings, which means that you have a deportation order or have a final removal or voluntary departure order. So if you are in immigration court, at the current time, then you need to really speak to an attorney regarding whether you can apply for an initial DACA. Uh, you also needed to have come to the United States before you reached your 16th birthday. You also needed to have continuously resided in the United States since June 15th of 2007 up to the present time. So this is where things get a little bit more complicated when uh, we're trying to first apply for DACA. And the reason is that you need to have physical 
uh, presence in the United States and you need to have um, evidence for every single month since June 15th of 2007. So for someone who has been in school this whole time since 2007 up until now, 2020, um, you can use your transcripts. But there are other DACA uh, initial applicants who will, will have to come up with evidence from either pay stubs that they've gotten since they've been working or bank account statements or you get really creative, maybe even like a gym membership that you've logged in or logged out of. So this is where a lot of people get stuck because if you can imagine, if, I, if you were to ask me to come up with something that lets everybody know that I've been here since June 15 of 2007 per month, um, I would have a hard time trying to find that evidence. So right now, currently, if you believe that you qualify for DACA, this would be what I would tell you is to start collecting the evidence of your physical presence in the United States since June 15th of 2007. So then, we're, um, then we need to prove that you're physical present in the United States and um, that you've had no lawful status since June 15th of 2012, um, that you are currently in school that you have graduated or obtained a certificate of completion from high school, or that you've obtained a general education development certificate, or that you were honorably discharged from veteran or the Coast Guard or the Armed Forces of the United States. So in order for you to qualify for DACA, you also needed to have graduated from high school or received your GED or have been part of the Armed Forces. Um, and then you also have to um, have good moral character and USCIS, which is the adjudicating body of these applications, look um, to make sure that you haven't been convicted of a felony, that you haven't had any significant misdemeanors, um, three or more uh, misdemeanors. And there are certain misdemeanors that would put you out of the running for DACA if they are crimes involving moral turpitude, so I can get more into the weeds um, once you get screened for something like that. But basically that you are a good uh, upstanding citizen with um, no criminal records that would uh, pose a, a threat to the United States or national security. And then, so another uh, piece, and I think this is where I want to focus more on what COVID, COVID's impact is having on the DACA decision that we just received on Thursday, is that if you currently had DACA, there is something called advanced parole, which would allow you to travel outside of the United States and enter the United States legally. And once you enter the United States legally, you meet the requirements if you have DACA and you have no unlawful presence to actually adjust your status or adjust your immigration status here in the United States without having to leave the country to the embassy or the consulate in the foreign country where you were born in. That makes a huge difference for a lot of people because it's very scary to leave the US without having any documents that will allow you back into the country, especially if you've been here your entire life. So advanced parole is another uh, entity that can be used for, for, by DACA recipients in order to actually adjust their status here without having to leave the country. However, because COVID-19 is still alive and real and a real threat for everybody. We also know that uh, there's a lot of travel restrictions happening right now at this very moment, not allowing DACA recipients to apply for advanced parole to be able to adjust their status here in the United States. So basically we, what we need is for DACA recipients to be able to travel and return with a legal entry in order to do this but unfortunately, because of COVID, it's not happening. So COVID is not only impacting uh, you know, our DACA recipients, but it's also impacting a lot of our um, asylum seekers who are stuck at the border right now, and a lot of our detained um, 
undocumented folks who continue to be in detention centers. Um, just recently, ICE had conducted a survey, well, um, conducted a study, and there is about 51% positive cases of detainees in detention centers. And so you can just imagine the impact that that is having on our brothers and sisters who are detained right now and, and what they're going through. And unfortunately, um, they are supposed to be considering the release of the most vulnerable populations who have underlying health issues that could be exasperated by COVID, but that's not happening either. And with all of this, all of these things going on at once, you know, um, it makes it a lot more difficult to be able to hold these uh, um, administrative bodies accountable for what they're supposed to be doing and what the law says they're supposed to be doing. So it's really important that we continue to um, push and make sure that these uh, administrative bodies are being held accountable. So that that is one of the um, pieces of how COVID-19 is impacting not only our DACA recipients, but also our asylum seekers at the border. So the I, we definitely want uh, people to consult with an attorney before thinking about leaving the country. Um, there is a legal process that must take place before you travel. And that legal process includes um, being adjudicated by USCIS and approved to do advanced parole. So please, if you have DACA, and, and you, uh, you understand now what advanced parole means, please do not leave the country before consulting an attorney because there's forms that need to be filled out and adjudicated by USCIS before you're granted advanced parole. And secondly, because of the threat of COVID being so alive in Rio, we also don't wanna put our DACA recipients at risk uh, for leaving the country, to, to leave the country and return on advanced parole if that means that they they could possibly um, contract COVID-19 while they're out. So it's a very um, slippery slope there. And we want to wait for direction of, a, of an attorney that you speak to before you make that decision. So we also want to talk about the actual um, decision and, and who, who chimed in on the opinion because uh, it was Chief Justice Roberts who joined the four more liberal judges. Uh, Roberts' luck, legacy is at stake, but he did also um, join the four to defeat the censored citizenship question. So even though uh, obviously Roberts is known for, Justice Roberts is known for uh, being more conservative judge on our Supreme Court, he, he did actually sign on to, to this opinion and we had his support to defeat the census citizenship question as well. Um, so I, I want to credit this to the influence that the social movements are having right now on, on our communities, on, on our Supreme Court decisions. I think that activism and advocacy um, is bringing a lot of these issues to light and it's definitely um, influencing uh, some of the decisions that are being made by the court in my opinion. Um, so I just, I wanted to point that out that all of these social movements, including the Black Lives Matter movement, I think had a huge impact on the decisions that were made just last week on Monday and on Thursday by the Supreme Court. So um, I also wanna point out though, that even though this was a win, um, it, you know, we didn't overall uh, answer the question, right? So the court refused to state that DACA is a legal program. And so that's a little problematic too, because the court is not taking a stance on saying that DACA is a legal program, and it defers to the Attorney General to answer that question. Um, ideally, uh, as practitioners, we would have wanted the court to come right out and say DACA is a legal program, we can continue to do this, uh, initial applications can be taken but they did not do that. So that's something that also to, to remember that the fight is not over, right? And then um, the court also said that DHS needed to only consider the impact that DACA would have uh, when and if they decide to bring this back to the Supreme Court. Um, and that, that gives a lot of deference to DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. I'm sorry if you're not uh, aware what DHS means. So the Department of Homeland Security need only consider the impact and that impact would require research and studies um, to happen to show what 
DACA community members um, contribute to our society as a whole and then as a economical um, impact as well. But the Corps also um, provided a roadmap for the Department of Homeland Security to rescind DACA in the future. And then it remanded the case back to the Department of, of Homeland Security for reconsideration. So even though this was a procedural win um, because uh, DHS did not follow proper procedure in order to file um, the terminate in order to terminate DACA, it does not necessarily mean that DACA is a legal program, and it does not necessarily mean that DHS cannot come back and refile and follow um, proper procedure in order for the Supreme Court to review again. So even though this was a, a, a win, um, there's still a lot of work to be done regarding DACA. So I just wanted to point out in the decision, um, because I thought this was, this was a little monumental as well for the court to do this for, this is exactly where the court um, decided to lay out the roadmap for DHS to respond to the court's opinion and what they decided to do. So I just, uh, I, I put this here in for context. Um, you guys can, can look up the opinion also and, and find this there. So now um, it is unknown if the Department of Homeland Security will accept the invitation to rework the rescission, which they can. Um, it would take a few months to get this done. Uh, we will probably have an election before they're able to do this. Uh, we also know that <clears throat> the decision whether to do this is largely political, especially with the administration that we have right now. And then, of course, the timing of the election, the poll numbers will all be factors on whether DHS decides to rework the rescission and, um, and try to terminate DACA again. So at the end of all of this, I think it's very important that we understand that the fight for DACA still continues. Um, so what we ask is to continue the, to fight this administration's anti-immigrant agenda by advocating for a permanent legislative solution for DACA recipients and all other immigrant communities at risk for deportation. Because DACA is not status. DACA is only a deferred action, which means that they are being um, shielded from deportation, but it does not give them legal status in, in this country. So uh, we want to continue that fight. And so a couple of the poly rec policy recommendations is that we provide state funding for legal services providers to respond to the increase in applications resulting from the restored DACA programs. Uh, back in 2012, when Chirla opened up its doors to do its first DACA applications, we did a thousand applications in that very first day. There was a line going all the way around our building, all the way up to blocks. So as you can imagine, um, legal services providers need uh, the help to be able to fill the need that is now going to be coming because of the restoration of the DACA program. So we need to continue to provide pathways for DACA recipients to use their work and social security benefits since impact arguments won the case. At the end of the day, the Supreme Court said that we did not have enough um, evidence uh, from DHS to evaluate the impact that ending DACA would have. So we have to continue to highlight these stories and, and to bring to the forefront, forefront everything that DACA recipients bring to this country. Um, individual recommendations, what can you do? You can continue to fight for social change with organizing, with protesting, with donations to organizations engaging in these activities since courts respond to pressure exerted by social movements, as I had mentioned before. Um, and then uh, I just want to remind you, Churla is one of those legal services providers. We have a $25 membership. You can invest in Churla. We have volunteer opportunities. Um, you can come and represent Churla at public events. Uh, we are all across um, California. So if, if, and we also have an office in DC and in Sacramento. Um, this is our uh, information. If you know anyone that needs an immigration consultation, if you know anyone that needs to renew their DACA, if you know anyone that needs to get screened for other immigration relief, um, this is our main office. This is our phone number. 
and uh, I want to make sure that everyone gets this. So I'm going to leave this um, up for a little bit. So I know there's probably a ton of questions and I'm sorry if I speak really fast. Um, I, I'm, I'm used to that now so I can slow it down and I have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to stop sharing and then um, we can get to questions if anybody has them. Hi, Maritza. Um, I am looking at the question. We have uh, a person online um, who says the following. I was told that I did not qualify for DACA because I was a year too old when DACA was first offered. I was, I have been here since I was eight years old and uh, uh, entered unlawfully and I'm now 39. I'm currently waiting for approval for a waiver and I think it's an I-601A or L-601A, I can't uh -huh. read. Is it better to wait and go through the process instead of trying to apply for DACA? I was told recently my application might be reviewed in about three months and leaving the country in about a year if approved. So I wanna talk about what these two different things are because as I had mentioned earlier, DACA is just a deferred action. It's a protection from deportation. But when you're talking about a 601A waiver, you're actually seeking status. You're seeking legal permanent residency in the United States. So I would um, suggest to, uh, I, I'm assuming you're probably working with an attorney and your attorney probably has advised you of the difference between a deferred action, which is protection from deportation and actual uh, legal status in the United States, which is legal permanent residency. Uh, if you have an opportunity to, and this I'm speaking in general because I'm not allowed to give you legal advice if you have an attorney already, but generally um, it is more advisable for you to actually seek status in the United States than seek deferred action. Because again, as mentioned before, deferred action only gives you protection from deportation. It does not give you um, legal permanent residency, which is status in the United States. Great. Hope that answered the question. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Is there any leg, uh, legalization or, or, or is there any legal action uh, to free the people who are in these detention centers or to get them better treatment? What, where's the advocacy around that? I think people are really wanting to help, uh, myself included. We don't know what to do, um, mm -hmm. and, but we want to do something. So. Okay, so yes, um, there is advocacy being done around this issue. So there's two things happening right now at different detention centers, and I can only speak to the ones that are in California because that's where I practice and that's where I've seen this done. So currently, um, after COVID-19 started spreading in detention centers, um, they started using really toxic cleaning um, agents to clean all of the service surfaces. And it was so strong that those in detention started getting nosebleeds. And so currently right now, we're working on just getting rid of the cleaning supplies that they are using in detention centers. So there's um, definitely petitions going around. There is also um, protest. Um, and at Adelanto, California, there's a, a detention center there and this last Sunday, I'm sorry, this last Saturday, there was a, a protest there. Um, but there's also, a, a, you can reach out to your US representative and there's a letter that you can write indicating why you think that they should stop using these harmful chemicals to clean up the detention centers. But then moving it up even more, um, it's a legislative issue because the adjudicating bodies, which is USAIS, ICE, um, EOIR, these are all the administrative bodies that control immigration in the United States. They are all under the direction of the president. So even though uh, Congress has the power to change the laws that affect our immigration system, these administrative bodies rule under the direction of the president. So it's a very difficult to get them to comply to the regulations that we would want to see in our detention centers. Um, but there is a way to push your representative to push the administrative bodies to make those changes. 
So what we've been trying to do is organize around bringing attention to the issue so that the pressure continues to stay on on these administrative bodies that make these decisions. So um, I can provide the link to the petition and then I can also provide um, dates for future actions that are going to be taking place at Adelanto and I will get that to, um, to anybody here that would like it or I'll get it to Mary and then Mary you can get it to the students or anyone on. Great and we'll put it on our website once we um, post this recording. Um, so I just wanted to go back to DACA. People who are eligible for, eligible for DACA, is there a hurry? Is there urgency to apply right away? Is it possible that this will, that, you know, the administration, the current <laughs> administration will rally and try to, to address the court's needs immediately and then opportunities will be lost? What's the, so, what's the urgency? There is a huge urgency. Um, thank you for bringing that up. And so there's two fold, two things happening right now. Because the Supreme Court has made the decision to not terminate DACA at this very moment, USCIS technically has to accept new initial applications. However, USCIS also has the power to reject these applications, again, because they're an administrative body. And USCIS also has not um, put out the regulation that's going to be used in order to determine eligibility for DACA. So USCIS as a body has to determine what the eligibility requirements will be for screening new initial DACAs. And then they also have to tell us how to file these new um, initial DACAs. And they have not done so. The statement that they put out was um, useless. And so us as an organization, Chirla as an organization, has filed the first initial DACA application the, the morning that the decision came out. Um, that's a bold move that we're taking because we're letting this administration know that they must follow the, the law and they must follow and uphold the decision that the Supreme Court of the United States has made. Um, even though we haven't had guidance from USCIS as an administrative body on how they want to adjudicate these applications, we feel that because the law stands as is, that we should continue to advocate for our clients and continue to file these initial applications. However, USCIS um, does have the power to determine how they will be adjudicating or if and when they will be approving these applications. Um, because they haven't given out any guidance, we will continue to file these initial applications until we are told how and when they wanted uh, us to, to do it. Um, on that note, it's also important for us to realize that DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, can file again to terminate um, DACA. And so whatever that may look like, if they do it as quickly as, you know, next month, or if they're going to wait until the election is over, I do not know. Um, however, I, if I was in the position of someone who can apply for DACA now, that is what I would do. I would do it now um, because at the very end, uh, you would at least have protection from deportation for the next two years. And we don't know who will be the president uh, for next year, so. But we have hopes. <laughs> yes, we do. We all do, um, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, we also have a question about um, HR 6, the American Dream and Promise Act. How likely do you think it's, it is that that will pass? So I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I wish it would. Um, I don't think that we have enough votes to pass it, to be honest. Um, we want real immigration reform and what's included uh, in, in HR 6 is, is real immigration reform, but I don't think that we have the votes in order to get that through, um, which is why, again, the urgency to continue to fight for DACA, um, because as I explained earlier, DACA is just deferred action and it's not status in this country, and we need to be able to address this um, legislatively. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we have two questions in the queue, and then I have a couple of questions on my own. And the two questions are related. Um, what kind of volunteer help could Shirley use? And 
can individuals who are not documented um, volunteer with your organization? Yes, um, definitely. Uh, we would love for anyone who would like to volunteer with us. Um, you can you can reach out on our web page, or if you want to do a direct um, contact, I will post my email address in the chat box. Uh, but yes, it doesn't. I, your status does not matter. Um, your status does not matter to volunteer. Uh, your status does not matter, in my opinion, for anything. Um, so if you wanted to volunteer. Uh, come on down. It doesn't matter if you're undocumented or you have no status or whatever it is that your situation may be. Uh, we more than welcome anybody to, to volunteer their time. And right now, currently, um, we are using a lot of our volunteers um, to help us uh, with the social movements that are happening right now, uh, including um, our unification with the Black Lives Matter movement. We are a coalition, so we work with many other organizations across the United States. Um, but then there's also a lot of programs in-house, like our legal services that we do, and even DACA renewals. Um, so we can use volunteers in a lot of different aspects of our organization. Great. And if you're an Oxy student, uh, we are actually working with Maritza and her organization through an internship program. And if you email me at mary at oxy.edu, I'll put you on the list. I'll ask you a few questions first, and then I will forward that information to Maritza and the people that are helping her put this enormous task together. Um, I, I had some questions about the handling of COVID cases for immigrant communities, not those only in detention, but in the larger community. We spoke about that um, in a different meeting, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, um, but it, what could people do? What's happening? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So what we've seen, and that's actually, so we are currently working from home, Chile as an organization, and we do not predict that we will be back in our office until next year at this point. And the reason is that there's a lot of underreporting of our black and brown communities uh, for COVID cases. Unfortunately, we are actually the ones that are impacted the most right now in California. Um, a lot of it has to do that we are, uh, a lot of our community members are domestic workers. A lot of our community members um, share very small living spaces um, with other family members. And so what happens there is that unfortunately, if one person obviously gets COVID, then it spreads and there isn't an opportunity to actually isolate themselves from the other family members that live in their, in their house. So because when we're being exposed more because we're mostly a uh, service workers or domestic workers, that's impacting the amount of people that, that actually get COVID. But then additionally, because we don't have um, the ability or the privilege to actually isolate ourselves in our homes, then that is only spreading it and multiplying it when we go back home. And even though um, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're trying to take all the precautions necessary, it's really difficult to get that into policy, right? And explain why it's impacting our black and brown communities more than it's impacting all other communities here in California. So because we're taking that into consideration, us as an organization do not wanna expose our potential clients or applicants. And so we are shutting down uh, completely and doing everything virtually now. So all of my consultations are now done through Zoom. Um, and if a client needs to come in and drop off documents, there's a huge procedure um, with cleaning, with shielding, um, and just making sure that we keep them protected as well, right? Because it's important that they, they continue to stay safe and that we continue to stay safe. And then additionally, so a lot of our clients are also undocumented um, if and when they lost their job or they have to be out due to COVID, the financial resources are also gone. So there's a lot of different layers that are impacting uh, the immigration work that we do right now because of COVID-19. So it's also just um, something we're trying to push through. But because of that, our executive director um, has made the decision that we are not going to continue to expose our communities um, or, you know, or, or put them in a danger by having to meet them person uh, face to face. So we also realize that a lot of our community members don't have access to technology um, to be able to continue this type of work. 
So we're actually inviting our community members if they don't have access to computers to do Zoom consultations online, to come into our satellite offices where we have a designated area that's just for the person to go in, use the computer that we're providing while I'm sitting in my space doing a Zoom consultation. They're in the office, but we're not physically uh, facing each other. So it avoids the contact and the spread hopefully as well. But we have been doing a lot of things to adjust as well. And, and we understand the impact that it's having on our communities and we're doing the best to eliminate that as well. Wow, thank you so much for that work, gosh. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, economic impacts that this has had on, on immigrant communities? What are we looking at? How are people managing in terms of you know, stimulus money? Are they mm -hmm. able to access the funds? So currently right now, if you are undocumented, um, you, were not, you did not receive a stimulus check from the federal government. And also additionally, if you are undocumented and married to a US citizen or legal permanent resident and you filed income taxes together, you also did not receive a stimulus check. Not only did the undocumented person not receive the check, but also the US citizen or the legal permanent resident did not receive a stimulus check because they were married to someone that's undocumented. And so I know that there's actual lawsuits happening right now. There's um, because uh, that's a benefit that a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident is entitled to, but because they've chosen to marry someone that's undocumented, the federal government has stopped that stimulus check from coming to them. So that's one um, thing that has happened. But then additionally, as I had mentioned, if you don't have a, a social security, a valid social security number, and you have not filed income taxes, um, you also did not receive a stimulus check. So a lot of our undocumented folks who were laid off and or can't do their work anymore, even if they were independent contractors that had their own small businesses um, and they were not able to do uh, earn an income, they also did not receive a stimulus check during this time. And so Churla is actually one of the organizations that, that is distributing funding for those undocumented folks that reside in uh, Los Angeles County and in Orange County. Uh, we are distributing $500 per person if you are undocumented. And uh, there's a phone number, a hotline number that you call Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And we just now opened up our lines on Saturdays. We worked this last Saturday um, from 8.30 to 12.30. So if you know somebody who's undocumented, Trilla is uh, distributing $500 per person to try and help um, with the economic uh, part that's impacting our community members. So I will also send that information over. Um, and it's, you simply have to uh, have uh, been impacted by COVID-19, whether that means you were laid off or you had to stay home and care for your uh, children. Um, and then you also need to be able to have proof of residence and then an, an identification. And it does not have to be a government issued identification. It could be, uh, something with your name and your photo on it, even a Sam's Club or Costco membership would work. Um, and these are just the three requirements needed to prove that you have been impacted by COVID-19 and that you qualify for the uh, DRE program, the Disaster Relief Assistance for Immigrants program that Trilla is distributing funds for. Wow, thank you. That's a great, great, amazing service. Do you mm -hmm. have a sense of how the this COVID-19 crisis is affecting housing for immigrant communities? So I know, um, I don't know too much about the housing situation. I only know about the impact that it's having on spreading, right? Because as I had mentioned earlier, unfortunately, you know, we, a lot of us live with family members and in close quarters, especially if you're <clears throat> part of the immigrant community, we don't always have, and as, as housing is, is an issue regardless, right? In LA, it's just, we need more housing. Let's just start there. But, affordable housing. Uh, yeah, more affordable <laughs> yeah. housing, uh, housing that we can all, you know, actually be able to afford and live in. But as you can imagine now with people being laid off because of COVID, then housing has become an even bigger issue because now families are getting together and living and, you know, in one space when before they were might be able to afford the single or the one bedroom. Now, all families are coming together in order to be able to just have a roof over their head at this point. 
and that is impacting the spread of what's happening. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I have on housing for now. Wow. Yeah, at this point, I just want to invite the other panelists on if they'd like to ask any questions, Malik and Caroline, if you'd like to join on, are you there? <laughs> any questions for, for Maritza? I think we've answered all the ones in the queue and... I would only say, Maritza, if you wouldn't mind, sort of, uh, we got a couple in the queue again. Um, maybe we'll answer it and we'll take those. But I would just say, before you leave, if you could give us a refresher uh, about things we can do to be helpful uh, before you take off. Okay, okay. but there's a couple questions there. Sounds okay, good. Thank you. one question. It says, I'm on this call because I'm a restaurant worker who has worked with undocumented immigrants. I think of, uh, I'm thinking about organizing to make our restaurant community safer, especially through the pandemic. Restaurants are a place where undocumented immigrants are dr a driving force of our industry. I think everyone involved with facilitating this discussion. And thank you. <laughs> thank much. you. So, um, I'm sorry, I don't know if there was a question there. I guess maybe what she could do to organize her restaurant community. Uh, okay, yeah. so um, so this has more to do with employment law, uh, if, you, if, if that's what you're looking for, uh, advice on that. So here's the thing, um, obviously if, if there is undocumented folks uh, working in the restaurant uh, field, there is obviously always a possibility to be audited. Um, I don't wanna overstep here. I'm not an employment uh, attorney. I just know the impact that it has on immigration. I would consult with an employee employment attorney about that. All I can tell you is that in California, there is a law that requires that all uh, businesses get a three day notice before they're audited. Um, and so if you were to ever receive a notification that your business was going to be audited, you have an obligation to tell your employees that you will be audited and that you will give them a three-day warning and then it's up to the employee to decide what they are going to do on the day that they know that um, they will be audited. Great, thank you. Oh, there's another question. For the funds that Cheerla is distributing, is a college address considered a permanent address? Um, yeah, if you're receiving mail there, wherever you, wherever you reside, that's what we'll use. Also, um, if you are living in transitional housing or if you're living in a shelter, a letter from the shelter is enough as also. Um, you can just get a letter saying that, you know, I'm living in a shelter and this is, you know, my proof of residence and that would be enough to qualify for the program. Um, there's also a section in the application that allows you to put a mailing address so even though we can confirm your residential address or where you're residing, if you don't feel like that's a safe space for you to receive that help because it's actually being distributed through the mail, again, trying to avoid person-to-person -person contact, and it's being distributed on a visa prepaid card. So if you don't feel like where you're actually residing is a safe space to receive mail, there is an opportunity for you to put a mail address where the card could get mailed out to. Um, so, so if either one of those situations is fine. Maritza, can you tell us a bit more about the services that Chirla provides? Um, so what might somebody see when they come to your website? Um, are there free legal resources? Uh, you've mentioned a number of programs. Is that a clearinghouse for all of those programs? So yeah, so Chirla as an organization has um, a lot of different, uh, I guess you would call them departments that we serve the community. So we have the civic engagement they actually bring out the vote. They may um, make sure that our community is civically engaged by registering voters, by filling out the census. Um, we also have membership. Uh, you can become a member. You get updates on immigration law, the changes that are happening, how you can get involved. We also have our policy team. Our policy works directly with legislation. They write legislation. Um, they work with uh, offices in Sacramento and in DC uh, because we're always trying to push the platform right to for immigration reform. We also have our, our external affairs, which is the coalition part. We work with other organizations on how our impact of immigration work will have on others, like including defunding the police and, and those type of movements. Uh, we also have our, excuse me, our legal services. 
and that's where that's where I work in that department. So our legal services provide affirmative legal services and removal defense legal services. And we have uh, four different units. We have our clinical unit, which does DACA renewals and naturalization. We have our removal defense unit, which defends people from being removed in this country if you're currently in removal proceedings. We have our family unity unit, and they actually help with affirmative applications. Um, people who are trying to adjust their status, people who might qualify for a U visa if they're victims of a crime that occurred here in the United States, uh, people that are consular processing that are outside and need to um, legally enter the country, uh, people who need 601A waivers, as mentioned before here, um, who entered once into the country and now need to exit and re-enter legally. Then we have our student legal services unit, which is the unit that I manage, and we serve all of the community colleges here in Southern California, but we also serve the Cal State Universities in Northern California. So we serve Humboldt, Sacramento, Sonoma, and Chico. And then down here in Southern California, we serve 14 different community colleges. And so what we provide is on-campus legal support for students. We do full screenings. And then additionally, if there is affirmative relief, we take on the case. Um, the other new unique thing about uh, Chirla is that our attorneys actually sign on the G28. We fully represent to the fullest extent our attorneys. These are not pro se cases. Even if you're just renewing your DACA, we sign a G28 and that means that we are legally bound to the students all the way through till the case is completed. Um, so it's a full service, full representation that extends, um, you know, and the cases stay with us as attorneys. Anything that we G28, it's for the life of the case. So that's something that's different that Chirla does um, because we want to make sure that our clients feel safe, right? And they, that they know that they're going to have a backup of an attorney or an advocate or a DOJ representative if, if that is the case and they, they need that. Great. Thank you. Maritza, you're a wealth of information and you and your organization is, are doing amazing work, really and truly we're thankful for yeah. it. Um, I will probably be getting some emails and I'll be in touch with you. Uh, I know you're working 24 you. seven, so we want to yes. stay on time and just thank you again for your amazing work for our communities. And thank you. And then we'll Charlie, remember touch. if you, yeah, if you guys want to volunteer, um, sign these petitions or do any of the work surrounding, uh, the Trilla, um, platform. You can go online, www.trilla.org, and there's a section and a button for volunteer. You can reach out to Mary or anybody else on this panel. They all have my information. Um, shoot me an email, and I'll forward it to our volunteer coordinators. Um, and then, yeah, stay in touch. Become a member. You get it's $25 if you have it. Become a member. You get updated emails with everything that's happening in immigration from statewide, local, all the way up to um, nationwide policy changes that we're trying to do. Great, thank you so much. We'll put that Great. link up. Thank you so much. Sounds good, thank you. I'm gonna let you go and hop on to my next one. Okay. Thank you everyone for the support. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone for joining.